actions continue to trail last week's comments by Speaker of Lagos State House of Assembly Mudashiro Abasa about plans to buy or rather buy the legislative body to pass laws in his words to protect indigents of Lagos from exploitation. Well, political analyst uh, Ayo Adio joins us now to offer his thoughts on the crisis being provoked by those comments and the immediate, medium and long-term impact of such legislation if it ever comes into existence. Thanks for joining us, uh, Ayo Adio. It's good to have you again. Thank you for having me. All right. Uh, do you see this coming? Or do you rather, do you see this coming? And uh, do you think the motive may have been pushed uh, to a large extent by rhetorics from the uh, previous elections? I'd be lying if I said I didn't see this coming, <laughs> uh, which was why I was quite vociferous after um, the just concluded governorship elections. And I made the point very clearly mm. that this rhetoric had to be stopped. Mm. This ethnic dog whistling had to be stopped and it had to be nipped in the bud. Uh, what I did not envisage um, was that at the Speaker's first day in office, um, he will make comments that will seem to promote um, that kind um, you know, of message, which I found very, very disappointing because the reality, I mean, you, you can, nothing stops you from passing laws that benefit indigents of, of any state. And I mean, if you're talking about social mobility, you're talking about creating housing preferences or mortgage preferences for indigents or protecting historical sites or cultural traditions. I mean, it's, um, it, it's a given. However, when you begin to dabble in the areas um, of, of personal liberties and property rights. Mm. You begin to swim in territories that could have lasting impact on the socioeconomic well-being of Lagos State. Mm -hmm. um, because the reason, aside many other things that Lagos seems to be rich uh, and, and is prosperous, is because to a very large extent, it protects um, individual liberties and property rights of persons across the world, which is the sine qua non for economic prosperity anywhere in the world. World. The moment you begin to dabble into um, plain politics with such rights and liberties, what you are doing in essence is transforming a state that is supposed to be a mega city or a smart city into some Yoruba caliphate that makes absolutely no sense to me. This is a billion dollar, uh, billions of dollars economy, arguably the largest in the entire West Africa, um, you know, second or third in the entire Africa. And we shouldn't be playing tokenism with this kind of economy. I expect that um, our leaders in the legislative arm of government should be more forward thinking, should be more imaginative um, in their approach and not, you know, meddle into political thinking that is just reductionist uh, and antiquarian in my own argument. But some would say that um, this particular sentiment is not just domiciled with the lawmakers in Lagos State because a lot of people have spoken and they say, Things that happen in Lagos State, for example, in other climes, in other states in Nigeria, indigenous do not permit a such liberty that in Lagos State, everyone probably can actually go away with, get away with blue murder in its metaphorical sense. But in Lagos, uh, but in other climes, things are stiffer. When you probably go to the north and you want to do some things, then you you find out that there are heavy restrictions in terms of your liberty. And when you actually go to the south, probably the south is to be very precise. They are very very cagey with how much they let foreigners, as they will call them, or other people that are not from are not domiciled are not from Saudis, probably establish themselves. So that Lagos is probably a little bit too liberal for their own liking and these people, some of those people that are agitating and fighting this know that in their own states and in their own regions, things like this are more cagey than it is in Lagos states. So there are two things here. First of all, the constitution of Nigeria recognizes citizenship and not indigenship. So it means it provides you and I, you know, with the right and the liberty to buy property and live anywhere in this country and my rights um, as a Nigerian must be respected, whether I'm in Kanu or in Lagos, right? So that's in its a, literal sense. In its literal sense. So, so, so I mean, the constitution is yes. clear on that, yes. right? So um, aside the constitutional aspect of it, the question you would have to ask yourselves is uh, whether you want a trillion naira economy 
But like I said, you want to hold on to certain ethnic, um, you know, religious or parochial cleavages at the end of the day. Um, because the way I view it, Lagos aspires, um, you know, to be a mega city, um, you know, one of the biggest and most admired cities in the entire world. Um, it is not a city that wants to just pander to certain kinds of ethnic um, identity. It wants to be, you know, the, the commercial hub um, of West Africa, or arguably the financial center um, of the entire Africa economy. And if that's the vision for Lagos State, then you can't be pandering, you know, to, <laughs> to parochial sentiments like where your neighbor comes from or it doesn't come from. L let me tell you something. 19th century Baghdad, you know, or, or whether it's Vienna in, 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 in the more recent times, in 19th century, these countries were the richest in their times because of diversity in their economy, because it provided people um, with the freedom to pursue, um, you know, their religious practices, protected their rights to invest in those particular economies. And Baghdad was arguably one of the richest economies in the ninth, ninth century because of those liberties, because of those rights and privileges that he afforded people, whether you were from Baghdad or not. You know, the same thing with Istanbul in the 17th century. So the question I always ask is if you want if you want to have, like I, like I said, a Yoruba caliphate, it's fine. But the, the, the effect, obviously, will be that you're not going to have the size of the economy that you dream of. The, the, the effect is that people are going to vote with their capital. They will take their monies in other places um, where they have rights and privileges. Um, and Adil, 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 let's go on a places. break. When we come back, we'll be looking at, because this is not... Probably new to Nigeria, understanding that we've seen it play out in France, in South Africa, and some other climes, even in Africa. But we'll go on a quick break. When we come back, we'll actually talk about this. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back to News on Horizon News, and we still have with us here um, Adio, and we've been talking about of the protection laws here in Lagos State and all that, all the backlash and all the commentaries that have actually. Um, been generated by this. And before we went on the break, I was speaking, I was trying to say that we've seen these things play out time and time again. This is not new to Lagos. Um, cities or metropolitan cities and metropolitan, um, cosmopolitan places around the world um, get, to find, get to find themselves in this particular bottleneck whereby the indigenous always, almost feel like they are losing their own grip on what should be theirs and what probably they should be enjoying. We've seen the Amazonians in Brazil, for example, um, fight the government time and time again that they are almost trying to erode their own culture. We've seen it play out in France time and time again. South Africa is a typical example in Africa whereby they feel that Nigerians are almost trying to overrun their own system and run them out of their own system. Hence, xenophobia that has actually been taking place in South Africa. So, probably some people will say that Lagosians are also trying to protect their own, that if they don't probably lay the mile markers on the ground, yeah. in a few years, probably Lagosians will be pushed out of Lagos. <laughs> Listen, managing diversities in, in democracies across the world is not an easy experiment. And, and that's the reality, like you rightfully pointed out. Um, you know, that in certain cities across the world, they, they are still grappling with how to deal with diversities in democracies. Um, however, one thing is clear, you know, that countries that allow diversities of thought, the richness of the diversities of culture, um, and the richness of the diversities of talent always outperform um, closed system um, economies across the world. That is why you have Nigerians um, who are mayors in the United States, Nigerians are mayors in Canada, um, in fact, someone of Pakistanish origin is, is Prime Minister of, of, of the United Kingdom today as we speak, right? So whether or not they are grappling with these um, um, diversity is not the question. The question is how they are able to move their society forward despite this lingering question. My argument, however, is that back home here, because you, you consistently make the point that, um, you know, the Lagosians have... The people who are driving these narratives aren't even from Lagos State. That is the million dollar question. That's the puzzle. Because in reality, I have, I have participated, 
um, for instance, in the Saleh Code Descendant Union meetings in the last five, six years. I've covered, you know, those events. And I can tell you that they are dealing with real issues. They want scholarships for their children. Um, they want mortgages um, for their working class. Um, they want better environments for places that they're living in the Saleh Eko. Um, uh, they want lands that have been taken away from them forcefully without compensation. And so the people who are pushing these narratives are doing so for political reasons, and many of them are not even from Lagos, right? So my argument really is people can do whatever they want um, with their states. Like you, you mentioned a few states in the north or a few states. They, people can do whatever they want with their states. But when certain regions have aspirations to be economic powers, economic hubs, and want to be able to attract global investments into that particular space, then at that very moment, that state must be willing to protect the rights and liberties of people who are not from that dominant ethnic group or share that I identity. I remember that this is, this, this is the mindset and the thinking that brought about Brexit because some people felt foreigners. Oh, yes, and they're paying heavily for it. I mean, the, the British economy continues to pay heavily um, for that emotional decision that they made. Right? That's why they are having to recruit doctors from everywhere across Africa. They're trying to get in teachers into the economy. Listen, you can't... And it was a political... Uh, it was a political issue then in the UK too. Yeah. A few politicians played on the emotions of people and got them outside, you know, Brexit, which they are suffering from now. And so that's why I said initially, I don't deny the fact that democracies are trying to reconcile um, diversities and how it works within large democracies. Um, but what you must never toil with, what you must never toil with is capital coming into those countries. This same UK that you talk about, their biggest clubs in their country are being sold to people from the Middle East, right? The Qataris own clubs in the United Kingdom. Yeah. They own big businesses in the United Kingdom. Indians own businesses there. Because the moment you start to discriminate property rights in, with ethnic divisions, those monies will go to other economies across the world. And if we want to, if Lagos wants to be a pace setter, you know, in terms of socioeconomic development in Nigeria, or even has aspirations of being one of the biggest cities in Africa, it can't afford to play politics with such a narrow world view. Mm -hmm. That is my argument. If it wants to be retrogressive, if it wants to be another Oshun state, mm -hmm. apologies to Oshun state, mm -hmm. um, if it wants to be another Kwara state, like where I come from, it's his choice at the end of the day. He can play the Yoruba politics at the end of the day, and people will vote with their monies outside the country. It's as simple as ABC. Oh, all right, uh, uh, Delhi. you talked about uh, the issue of uh, moving forward. Uh, Lagos is a cosmopolitan, cosmopolitan uh, city as it were. But uh, whether we like it or not, this argument is still unabated. It's still those pushing the rhetorics that Lagos is a no man's land. And uh, sometimes when you think about it, are they deniers of history or they're just ignorant of, it, of, uh, uh, of history as it were? My problem, however, is that this thing seems to have been invented from the thin air. Because in my conversations, I've never heard anybody call Lagos a no man's land. I'm not sure how many people from this particular ethnic group that work in your office who have said it openly that Lagos is no man's land. So I wonder where this invention was created, that certain people are saying Lagos is no man's land. Let me tell you, there's a place in Kanu uh, called No Man's Land, right? It's even dominated by people from this particular ethnic group. Nobody has a problem with it. It's no Man's Land, close to Paniso in Kanu. Mm. Many of the properties owned, they are owned by people that are not from Kanu state or for people. I believe they call group. them Sabungeri or something. Thank you, it's close to Sabungeri, mm. but it's called No Man's Land. Mm. It's not a problem. Mm. Do you understand what I'm saying? You know, I, I get upset about this thing sometimes because my grandfather lived in Benin Kanu for 55 years. My father has been in Kanu for over 70 years. So my family has put in 120 years in Kanu state. Nobody has ever told me that, you know, I'm saying here is no more of, or say I should go back home somewhere. Hmm. Never. So how come the most cosmopolitan state in Nigeria, the economic hub of West Africa, hmm. suddenly wakes up and wants to start playing ethnic um, uh, uh, you know, perioka because of politics, it makes no sense to me. So if, if, like I keep saying, if you want Lagos to be, and in fact, if you even look at the history of Western region or politics in Nigeria, Lagos never even wanted to be part of the Western region as it were. Mm -hmm. That was why they, they wanted to be separate. They were federal. 
They didn't even want to play the politics of the Western region, yeah. in essence, right? So I don't know where all of these things is coming from. Um, 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 and like I said, if the people of Lagos so wish that, you know, they want the states to be reduced. I have acres of land in my village in Ilori now. I'm, I'm sure you have land in your village, <laughs> right? <laughs> Why are you not sitting your land? The reason we're having these debates is because people are paying premium for land in Lagos. Many of the people who are rich, who are multi-millionaires, is because they sold their land to people who had the capital to pay for it. I mean, how many, how many, how many locals can afford to buy the kinds of estates um, that we see across Lagos? Today, as we speak, they are retailing land in Ibejuleki like Gala. You know, everybody is, is, is retailing land, telling you it's close to a refinery. Everything is being sold. People are buying. Tomorrow again, people are not going to cry that those lands have gone. When you got financial rewards for it, those so lands had no, we, those had, had no commercial them. value before. How do we try to balance this? Exactly. So my own, my own idea of yeah. what a balancing act is, is that there are realities that, you know, even though Lagos has become a mega city, you know, there, there are people here who have, you know, you know uh, uh, their umbilical cord is tied to Lagos. They mm. can't run in Kano. Mm -hmm. They can't run in Enugu. It is Lagos. Mm. So I believe that there has to be some sort of concession. You know, I don't know how that works. Maybe setting appointments has to be reserved for people from Lagos. Um, there are 40 seats in Lagos State House of Assembly. Maybe there's a creation for about 15 seats um, that cuts across, you know, Ojo, um, Ibejuleki, Lagos Island for people who come from Lagos. You know, maybe there are mortgage programs, uh, scholarships, whatever it is. I think those kinds of con uh, uh, conversations have to be on the table mm. um, so that these, you know, people who have no else to go to um, would enjoy certain kinds of privileges um, because they come from this particular state. Mm. I think that's a conversation worth having. Right. Um, and I think that that would be a step in the right direction if, mm. if some of these things, um, you know, are put to work. But, but really and truly, um, this, is, this, is, this is where the money is. And, and as long as it's where the money is, somebody can wake up and sell his mm. grandfather's house that, you know, didn't mean anything for over 300 million naira in Lagos. That's the beauty of Lagos. Right? He, he, there was no rich person in his family before, but suddenly he wakes up, a dilapidated bungalow can go for 300 million mm. because there's somebody willing to place a premium on it because it's the economic hub of West Africa. All right. Uh, on that note, so we'll see how it goes uh, <laughs> regarding the, uh, you know, the, the motives for that. Um, Ayodele, a political analyst, would like to thank you for your time and also for your uh, perspective on the issues. Good to have you. Thank you.